with prayer and then go into your presentation. All right. Well, <clears throat> welcome everyone. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, I do pray that um, as I speak tonight, that you would help each of us to draw closer to you, um, help us to be more effective in our witness to other people in the world, uh, give us your courage to speak to people and your boldness, and also the wisdom to be able to speak with love. We ask this in the name of the Father and of the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Deacon Scott McKellar, and I'm a pastoral associate at St. Therese. Uh, I work full-time in the office, uh, generally preparing couples for marriage and um, helping to facilitate baptisms at the church. And our topic tonight is, why would you want to be Catholic? And perhaps I should start by saying that I have not always been Catholic. I actually grew up um, as a Protestant Christian, and I even completed Protestant seminary training to be a Protestant minister before becoming Catholic in 1995. I sometimes joke that I was a, a slow learner spiritually because I was baptized twice and confirmed three times, but I now believe my original baptism was the only one I needed. Well, technically, the Catholic Church does not consider me a convert. Uh, instead, they consider me a Christian who has now come into the fullness of faith or into full communion with the Catholic Church. And so when I answer the question, why do I want to be Catholic or why am I Catholic? I think that many people would expect to hear a somewhat intellectual answer, but I believe that that's really only part of the answer to this whole question. I would like to connect this idea to a quote from Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI. He famously said uh, this line, being a Christian is not the result of an ethical choice or a lofty idea, but the encounter with an event, a person, which gives life a new horizon and a decisive direction. So my journey of faith and ultimately my journey into the Catholic Church was much more about my relationship with Jesus than a purely intellectual journey. Now, there were things that were intellectual about it, but if you'll allow me this metaphor, I fell in love with Jesus, and in a certain sense, I was overcome by the beauty and the person of Jesus, who I came to recognize as being present in the Catholic Church. So really, my journey had much more in common with the parallel discovery of my love with my wife, Wendy, and eventually the very personal decision to marry her and form a family with her. Now, I spend all day talking to young couples, so forgive me for having my brain on this track, but, but it seemed like a good analogy. Um, now, this is a really important idea. Very often when people are sharing with others why they should become Catholic, they focus on ideas and not on relationship. And I think if we do this, uh, very often the whole enterprise fails. It doesn't work. So the answers that I needed 35 years ago to make the decision to marry my wife were very personal. I needed to know, was she already married? Um, did she already love someone else? And most importantly, did she love me? Now, someone who valued very different things from me might have shared some things about my wife, Wendy. She plays guitar and flute. She is the firstborn in her family. Uh, they might have shared that she is a gifted school teacher. And all of these things are important parts of my wife, Wendy. But at that time, they weren't the most important questions that I needed to answer. And I think very often, especially with our youth, when we're trying to pass on why the Catholic Church is important, 
we have not begun by genuinely listening. Each one of us has very personal questions about our beloved. The things that impress us may not impress others in the same way. And believe it or not, when they've interviewed youth who have left, very often one of their complaints is, nobody would talk to me, nobody would answer my questions. Well, I grew up in Canada um, in something that was very like the United Methodist Church. Um, in Canada, a bunch of traditions like that formed a single church called the United Church. But I also had a grandfather who was a Baptist minister for about 60 years. Now, the church of my youth, which was basically Methodist, had at its highest value being accepting and inclusive in every way. They would have loved the motto of the modern Planet Fitness gym as being a judgment-free zone. Um, and there's some very wholesome aspects to this way of thinking, especially when you're dealing with social justice issues like racial prejudice, immigration, or just generally being inclusive. The problem is, if you make this your entire focus, it's a very limited vision of the faith. And one of the values in my own heart as a young man was a deep search for integrity. I was looking for people who were authentic. And if saying that we will not judge others means that we don't believe in sin and we have no sense of right or wrong, how can we trust people to understand what it means to be faithful? If I believed that my future wife, Wendy, did not understand the difference between being faithful to me and being unfaithful, I would not have married her. Being loving and accepting does not prevent me from seeing a lack of integrity or knowing that someone is on the wrong path. Now, later on, the pastor of my childhood church actually had something very traumatic happen. His own daughter became a prostitute and a drug addict. And I should say that he was eventually able to rescue her from this destructive life, but this experience left him changed forever. Yes, we should be loving and accepting of everyone, but it doesn't mean that we can't help people to discover that certain ways of living do not lead to happiness. Being authentic as a Christian means following Jesus and not the freedom to do whatever we want, and certainly not to be silent when our friends are making dangerous or bad choices. So when we think about it, our faith is actually really not about the rules or following the rules. That's something often that maybe teenagers, I had five children, would say to you, you know, you're just trying to guilt me. It's all about the rules. But our faith is really about relationship with the one who loves us. And he desires the very best for our life. So in a sense, his rules are just wisdom about finding happiness. As a youth, I already had a sense that something was not right in this kind of love and acceptance thinking, but really it was not until college that I began to develop a relationship with God through personal prayer and Bible reading, and eventually I had the encounter with the person of Jesus that Pope Benedict was talking about. I had tasted the typical life of a college student with parties and uncontrolled freedom. And somehow it just left me empty and feeling lonely inside. And I was seeking something more. And so through prayer and reading the Bible, I found a new way of seeing the world where Jesus actually became the center of my thinking. It wasn't so much that I was rejecting what I had before, but it was more about my life having a completely new perspective. And it would be fair to call this a conversion. Now, we don't have time, but there's a whole story here about how all of this took place and the encounter that God gave me that led me to this place. But I'm gonna tell a bigger story here, so I'll move on. 
And so after this happened, I began to seek fellowship with Christians who thought like I did, who, who were like-minded. And I began to explore a number of different Protestant denominations. I didn't find what I was looking for in the denomination I grew up in. And I was really looking for a church that was most like Jesus and that was trying to authentically follow the teachings that I found in the Bible about Jesus. So in the Protestant world, at least, churches of this type form a kind of marketplace where each group claims to be following Jesus just as it's seen in the Bible. And they try to persuade people that they're doing it better than the one down the block. And so you should come with us. And the problem is that there were many differences in interpretation about what the Bible says. And they typically expected each individual person to read the Bible for themselves and decide what they believed. So just kind of make up your own mind. Everybody decides. I did kind of bounce around with in some different uh, churches and I was involved in a campus club, an evangelical campus club doing Bible studies and evangelism. And eventually uh, after college, I felt a call to be involved in ministry and I desired to know as much as I could about the Bible, so I enrolled in a large Protestant seminary. My seminary was interdenominational, and it actually had a great variety of different Protestant perspectives at it. And I had difficulty kind of endorsing any one group at the seminary because I could see both the strengths and the weaknesses of each group relative to the teachings of the New Testament. And basically, I did a master's degree in New Testament studies, studying Greek and trying to find out, you know, to the best of my ability, what the Bible said. Well, soon in my studies, I began to have some intuitions about the early church from the New Testament. And these discoveries did not really match up with the typical practice of, of many evangelical Protestant groups who claim to be following the Bible alone. For example, it became clear to me that in the New Testament, the central physical act of worship for the early Christians was the ritual that many people called the Lord's Supper. In the early church, the Lord's Supper was celebrated each time the Christians came together to worship. Now, if you're a cradle Catholic, uh, that doesn't sound like a new idea. <laughs> we do that every time. But for most Protestants, um, if you're lucky, they might do this four times a year. So they'll have their normal church services, and then they tack on the Lord's Supper at the end, maybe about four times a year. So this intuition um, really kind of set me on edge compared to the experience I was having in many of those churches. Um, I also remember uh, reading the Greek text of the book of Galatians by Paul. And in it, he says something like this, as many of you who have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So clearly the verse is suggesting that baptism joins us to Christ or brings us into communion with Christ. And again, um, as a Catholic, I read that verse when I'm doing the baptism ritual, it's in the book. Um, but that's a really different idea for many Protestants. I remember the professor uh, kind of doing backflips to try to explain why it couldn't possibly mean what I just said, but it means what I said. Also, St. Peter tells the crowd at Pentecost, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So these kinds of discoveries left me wondering, could it mean that the Bible actually teaches the idea of sacraments? Most of the groups that I'd been involved with 
didn't believe in sacraments. So, oh my gosh, what could this mean? And finally, I did a really extensive study of the idea of tradition. And in most uh, Protestant tradition uh, groups, tradition is a bad word. Okay, there's Bible and tradition. Tradition's bad, Bible is good. But I did a really extensive study of, of tradition in the New Testament. And much to my surprise, St. Paul, many times, says things like this. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I have delivered them to you. And <clears throat> in ancient Greek, um, the language he's using is a very specific kind of tradition language. And he's basically saying, tradition is good. Follow my traditions. Again, that was kind of a new idea for me and kind of shaking up my world. Now, truthfully, many of the professors at the seminary I was at were British Anglicans who had come over to teach. And so I was beginning to be exposed to some of these things from an Anglican perspective. And that was closer to a Catholic kind of perspective. But soon I even began to ask myself the question, what if the Catholics are actually right about all these things? And I think we need to stop here and circle back to the idea of relationship. You see, I still held very deep prejudice against the idea of becoming Catholic, even if uh, I kind of thought, hmm, that sounds kind of Catholic. Um, I, I, for some reason, just couldn't bring myself to go there. I respected my Catholic friends. I liked some Catholic authors. But swimming the Tiber was a big leap of faith. It just wasn't something I was going to do. So uh, this is kind of where I was at when I left seminary. And at this point, uh, my faith took a bit of a detour as I became involved in uh, the Protestant charismatic movement. So there was a big uh, revival and charismatic thing going on. I became deeply involved in that and became part of a, a church that grew from five people to 5,000 people in a very short time. Um, but interestingly, this became part of my story as well. Well, I had had these earlier intuitions about the early church from the Bible. I began to have a variety of new experiences that continued to kind of point me in that Catholic direction. The church traditions I'd grown up with uh, were very modern and simple. Uh, my particular church in the town I lived in was, uh, it won a prize as, as being designed by this modern architect as being this new, exciting, modern kind of church. It was not traditional at all. Um, and the kind of worship experience we had was very modern. Um, but um, I did kind of see that, that maybe that simplicity could have a type of beauty to it, but it didn't really excite me in any way. It didn't, it didn't make me want to get closer to God. I do think that I experienced some beauty in, in contemporary worship, uh, the church that I became involved with later on um, <laughs> actually had an entire worship team of paid full-time musicians and a $100,000 sound system. And they wrote their own music each week. And really, the, the musical experience was awesome and amazing. And people were coming from all over the place to experience it. But somehow... Uh, the more classical beauty of, of tradition in the church, church architecture, beautiful religious art, stained glass, high altars, even vestments, had a kind of allure for me. So somehow looking over the fence, I would see these things and something in my heart would draw me towards that. Things like incense were completely outside my experience, but somehow they seemed to communicate the mystery of God's presence in a way that touched me deeply. It's hard to describe, but 
beauty has its own authenticity. If I continue with the metaphor of relationship and even of falling in love, beauty makes her own compelling arguments and they're not aimed at the mind, but at the heart. I remember uh, a funny story where um, some Protestant friends of mine um, actually described uh, venturing into a Catholic church without realizing it during adoration. And they stayed a little while and they're watching what's going on in adoration. And then they fled out of the church and they told me, stay out of there. It's very seductive. <laughs> so I was like, what? <laughs> That's a weird thing to say. Um, but that, that was kind of like something that was going on in my heart. There was something about it that was compelling and drawing me. I also, even though I was Protestant, I began to be impacted by the saints. Now, that sounds kind of weird, but um, I remember watching a BBC documentary on Mother Teresa, now St. Teresa of Calcutta. And as they showed her life, already during her life, she was living this compelling countercultural witness to the faith that just drew me in and, and caused me to, to want to recognize her as, as being uh, very saintly. And from this documentary, it was so clear that God was with her. I, I think there were actual miracles on the BBC documentary. I'm not kidding. Uh, she would pray and things would happen. And they weren't trying to make a big deal out of it. They're just reporting. But oh my gosh. Then uh, just because I became interested, I read a history of St. Francis, and I became very interested in Franciscans and Franciscan tradition. Um, I later read uh, St. Francis's little medieval work called The Little Flowers of St. Francis. It's just a tiny little book about the kind of biography of his life. And believe it or not, during this time, I actually believe that St. Anthony of Padua uh, the guy who helps us find things, he actually found me and befriended me. So I have no idea, but, but just he suddenly showed up in my life. And I was like, wow, who are you? And, and suddenly I got mail, like I got something sent to me from some St. Anthony group or something. And uh, they sent me like a little relic, I don't know, third class or something. But I have no idea where it came from. But he just kind of entered my life, and he eventually became my confirmation saint. So I mentioned before that I'd already made some discoveries about the role of tradition in the Bible, um, but as a Protestant, I now made the ultimate fatal mistake. I decided to read the earliest church fathers that follow the New Testament. So the stories of the Christians who were the very disciples of the apostles in the first couple centuries right after the Bible. And <clears throat> it's interesting, uh, many Protestants read the New Testament as if the early Christians believed and lived just like modern ones do. But when I began to read these early Christians from the year 100, the year 200, um, what I saw right away is after the apostles, there were bishops, they were saying mass, they had a liturgy, they called this thing the Eucharist, and they were baptizing infants. In fact, they were Catholic. It just was, there was no doubt about it. These were not Baptists. These were not Pentecostals. These were Catholics. And they even believed that Jesus was present in the Eucharist and that he founded the church and passed on his authority through the apostles to the bishops. That's all there in the first couple hundred years. So really, you're left with only two choices. Either the second century Christians are the disciples of the apostles who have passed on this information, or the church immediately became corrupt days after Jesus died. And honestly, the idea that it became immediately corrupt makes absolutely no sense historically. That doesn't make any sense. 
the one holy Catholic and apostolic theory makes sense. That really makes sense. So this definitely rocked my boat, okay? Because if we were to understand the New Testament, clearly the people in the New Testament would still have remembered Jesus. Some of these people would say, oh yes, I sat at the feet of John the Apostle. And he said, this is what they're writing about. So these are the disciples of the apostles. So in fact, I already knew from my studies earlier on, on tradition that this idea of succession in leadership or passing down authority to the next generation was the normal practice both in the Greek world and the Jewish world. This is how you became a Greek philosopher. This is how you became a Jewish rabbi. So when you hear St. Paul say to Timothy, who, by the way, was the first bishop of Ephesus, Paul says this to him, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable men who will be able to teach others. So Paul is giving something to Timothy that he wants to pass on to others who he wants to be passed on to others. That verse is about succession. Um, <clears throat> I was also impacted in the area of prayer in several ways. Um, first, um, I began to discover the idea of praying the Psalms daily um, through the Liturgy of the Hours. And the idea of praying these, these Psalms along with literally millions of other Christians uh, following the same pattern really awakened in me this idea of the communion of saints, of, of the church being alive on the earth and participating in that. Now, at the same time, in my own personal conversational prayer with God, I began to recognize that God was giving me a gentle nudge in my prayer. So no, no big voice, just a little nudge, okay? When I was at seminary, I actually had a Pentecostal friend come and hide under my window in the dormitory, and he said, Scott, Scott, go to Africa. Fortunately, I recognized his voice, but, but this wasn't a voice. It was just kind of an intuition in my prayer. God was giving me a little nudge, and I don't remember the exact intuition, but it was something like go back to the beginning, go back to the beginning. And believe me, I got the point. I understood. So all these thoughts and feelings began to come together in one kind of chorus. And I began to want the whole package. I wanted the historic church, the one that Jesus founded, the apostolic church. Yet, again, I was still reluctant to become Catholic. This, this whole journey here, this is 10 years of thinking, I should become Catholic. No, 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 I can't become Catholic, okay? And so I came up with another compromise, and it was, why don't I become Anglican instead? They have bishops, okay? So uh, taking this road to Canterbury allowed me to be confirmed by the hands of of a metropolitan archbishop and to experience actually the very same liturgy that we use in the Catholic church. Now it's a little different now, we've changed it, but, but there was a joint commission and the Anglicans and Catholics were saying the same modern liturgy. Um, so I became Anglican and, uh, but as I stayed there for a couple years, I began to recognize that many of the problems that I had experienced in my childhood church were actually also taking place here in this Anglican church. Soon, uh, things kind of came to a head in terms of problems. A new bishop was elected, and he was so far outside the norm for Anglicans that he became a news item all the way to Canterbury. So this guy was super, super radical. The three largest parishes in his diocese 
literally went into rebellion refused to and refused to cooperate with them. There were court cases that took years to resolve. So in a decision that was made even before things got really ugly with this Anglican bishop, my wife and I went back into discernment mode and decided it was time to become Catholic. So we began to visit different uh, Catholic churches in our area. We visited um, a Benedictine monastery, which had public services as well. And eventually we joined an RCIA program. Predictably, we picked the parish that had the best preacher. And yes, we did pick the all-star team. This priest went on to become bishop and eventually archbishop. So why would you want to become Catholic? Very likely, your reasons are actually personal. For me, my relationship with Jesus led me to be moved by his truth and beauty and goodness as they were reflected in his church. So maybe my Protestant friends were right. I was seduced. But I have no regrets. For me, the Catholic Church is a bride that I've been happily married to for 35 years, 25 years. Um, my search for authenticity um, is fulfilled the closer I get to the person of Jesus. In Jesus' great prayer in John 17, he prays to include all people in the church. But the ground of our unity is communion with him. We are only one to the degree that we are like him and in him. He says, I pray not only for them, that is the apostles, but also for those who believe in me through their word, so that they may all be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, and they also may be in us, that the world may believe you sent me. If we want to help others to discover reasons to become Catholic, we must first have a deep, committed relationship to Jesus. This communion with Christ will lead to our witness that the world may believe you have sent me. Well, thank you for uh, listening to my story. Um, we could now uh, take some time and, and open things up for questions. Um, Tressa said I had 30 minutes. I was pretty close. <laughs> um, so uh, feel free. Uh, you can unmute yourself and ask a question. You can click on the chat and type a question. Um, a good practice is uh, to give people a little bit of time to think. So why don't we take a minute and just think about whether or not you might have a question. Deacon, may I ask a question? This is Wayne. Sure, sure. Um, can you describe uh, in your own personal experience what does the relationship with Jesus mean to you? How did you experience it in your daily life? Because sometimes words to that if we're talking to those who have interest in uh, a deep faith and we say, well, it's all about relationship, uh, in your own personal experience, how would you describe that? Uh, okay, so uh, what does personal relationship look like? Um, so um, I don't really think that it's any different than a relationship that we would have with any human person. Is like a relationship with a friend. So um, I used to have a friend and, and he was a little bit uh, uh, funky in what he did, but he would sit down and buy two coffees, one for himself and one for Jesus. And he would set that cup of coffee across from himself 
and and he would literally imagine that Jesus was there and he would talk to him. And that might sound like a very funky kind of uh, Protestant thing that someone would do, but St. Teresa of Avila says something very similar, that really um, it's just a friendly conversation with a person that we know at a deep level. Now, on the other hand, uh, this relationship isn't just with a human person, it's with God. And so very often when we come into God's presence, uh, we become aware of the difference between ourselves as a sinful human person and God. And so often the first step is it becomes an, a sense of humility and awareness that, that, that we are not worthy to be reaching out to God because of who we are. Um, so in the steps and kind of stages of that process, that's a very common kind of feeling, but we just have to remember that, that St. Paul said, yet while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Or in the parable of the, the prodigal son, the father is actually out on the road, watching, waiting, just hoping that his son will come back. And when he does, the father does something that is completely uncharacteristic for an ancient Near Eastern patriarch. He runs to his son. He throws his arms around him. So yes, when we enter God's presence, we can do so as if he's just a friend. When we actually encounter him, we often become aware of, of the difference between us and God and, and are led to feel a sense of awe and, and humility towards God, but it shouldn't turn us away because he still desires us to be there and to bring healing and, and draw us into relationship. So um, how does that work? Uh, it is what the Catholic Church would describe maybe as mental prayer rather than uh, the prayers that we might do, like the rosary, although the rosary could be mental prayer, it depends how you do it, but, but it's not a recited prayer, but a time of, of waiting and listening and talking to God. Um, and as you do that, then you encounter God and, and your heart begins to change. So I don't know, <laughs> is, that, is that a sufficient answer? Yes, thank you. I'm uh, sure. I uh, appreciate it very much. Thank you. I have a question here in the chat room, Scott. Okay. Uh, it asks, could you share more about being confirmed three times? <laughs> okay. So um, basically, uh, as a child, I was baptized in something like the Methodist Church uh, in, as an infant baptism. And uh, I have my baptism certificate, and it says that I was baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit with water. And it even says into the Holy Catholic Church, but they used a small C. Um, <laughs> but, but I believe that was valid. But then as I went on this journey, I was involved in, um, oh, and then as a child as well, a uh, teenager, I was confirmed uh, into this uh, United Church. But then uh, during college, uh, I was involved in groups that believed that um, you had to already be a believer before you could be baptized. So I was baptized again by immersion as an adult. And then um, when I became Anglican, because I was really, really looking for that apostolic connection to the church, I insisted on having an archbishop confirm me so that I could join the Anglican church. I could have just gone there. They would have been happy. But I, I went through the process of making sure that that would happen. And then, of course, the Catholic church would recognize my first baptism as an infant. But we don't recognize confirmations of other churches. So when I joined the church in RCIA as a Catholic, I was confirmed again. Uh, so that's three confirmations. Oh. 
Anyone else? Deacon, uh, another question. Uh, did Wendy, uh, did she follow the same path and the same timetable as you, or did it, would she have a, a slightly different uh, uh, story? Okay, so uh, as I said, everyone's story is personal. And so the things that, that happened to me that, that led me to think the way that I thought uh, did not necessarily happen to her, but she was married to me. <laughs> so, um, and at one point she actually said, look, we can go anywhere, but not Catholic. Um, <laughs> she, she did not want to become a Catholic. And, um, but at the point at which uh, we had already become Anglican, which actually was uh, something that she had been as a child. So that wasn't like a, a huge jump for her. Um, but we kind of recognized, you know, there were problems, this wasn't working out. And uh, so at that point, uh, she went away on her own and did her own prayer and her own discernment. And for her own reasons, uh, came to the conclusion that she wanted to become Catholic. In fact, so much so that she said, I want you to understand, if we become Catholic, and you change your mind, I'm not leaving. This is where I'm going to be. Um, so it was it was very definitely uh, something that she decided for herself with her own reasons, using her own discernment. I, I might have been a cat. <laughs> Thank you. Deacon, could you tell us a little bit about what led you to that? Uh, sorry, that didn't come through clearly. Can you repeat the question? Yes, I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about how you uh, became excited to go to the deacon program. Oh, good. Okay, so uh, how did I become a deacon? Um, <laughs> um, I did not uh, follow the normal path. I, I don't think I've done anything the normal way. Um, so uh, there... Uh, under uh, Pope Benedict, uh, there was kind of a recognition that there were a large number of Anglicans um, who desired uh, unity with the church. They desired to become Catholic and perhaps even have their, uh, their ministry recognized by the Catholic church, even to the point of entire groups of Anglicans, like a whole church joining the Catholic church at once. And previously, the way this was set up was each individual person had to go to a bishop, and the bishop got to decide whether or not and on what terms that person would be able to enter the church and whether they could, if it was a, an Anglican priest, could they remain a Catholic priest. And the process was, was difficult and was handled differently in all kinds of places. So. Pope Benedict created a new institution in the church that was called the Ordinaria. And essentially, it was a non-geographic diocese. So it's like we have the Diocese of Kansas City. Well, imagine if there was a diocese that covered all of North America, and it had its own bishop, and that bishop lived in Houston. And if you were Anglican, and you wanted to join the Catholic Church, you could approach that bishop and he could decide what your fate would be, obviously in dialogue with the church. And so um, I was happily working as a lay person, even though I had uh, seminary training, um, but I'd never you know, tried to approach the church and say, you know, is there some kind of uh, clerical orders that I could have because of this background? And then after the ordinariate came about, um, I realized that perhaps there would be this new avenue 
uh, where as a former Anglican who went to a seminary with Anglican professors, uh, maybe I could approach this bishop and see what he thought uh, should happen. And so after a uh, conversation with him, it was kind of decided that um, it, it would be possible if I would like to do this to become a permanent deacon in the ordinariate. Now, many of you are familiar with uh, Father Randy. Um, he was actually um, a metropolitan archbishop, not the one who laid hands on me, but he was a, an Anglican archbishop. And so he actually became an Anglican, a, a Catholic priest. But in my case, um, I was happy to become a permanent deacon. So I was discerning, you know, what should happen here. And that was kind of the discernment that came out of that. And um, so I didn't go through the, the formation that would normally happen in, the, in this diocese, but instead um, I traveled down to Houston and received training um, along with uh, a number of Anglican men who were actually mostly training uh, to enter into the Catholic priesthood, but there was a small group of us who uh, were going to be permanent deacons. So uh, the smaller group was ordained as deacons, and then the larger group uh, as transitional deacons, and then finally uh, became Catholic priests. So um, I'm actually incarnated into that non-geographic diocese, which covers all of North America, and my bishop lives in Houston, and I'm actually on loan to the Diocese of Kansas City, St. Joseph, and then the bishop here has given me faculties uh, to be able to exercise ministry as a deacon. So again, um, I, it kind of worked differently for me. I have another question from the chat room. This is interesting. You're probably uniquely qualified to answer this. Uh, when you prepare couples for marriage, are there times when one or both of them do not love Jesus? And if so, how do you help them understand that is part of holy matrimony as being Catholic? Okay, so um, in the Catholic Church, um, we can have two Catholics marry. We can have a Catholic and a Protestant Christian marry, and we can have a Catholic and uh, someone who is not a Christian at all, Mary. They, they could be another faith, a Muslim, a Jew, uh, a Buddhist, or they may have no faith at all. And uh, in each of those scenarios, um, if people love each other and they desire to get married, they have to go through some training to understand what marriage is all about. Um, but we would allow people to marry in each of those circumstances. Now, if the people are Catholic, uh, then I can encourage them uh, how the sacrament of matrimony would uh, be very helpful in their relationship and the things that the fruit that might come from that. If it is two baptized Christians, uh, but one of them is not Catholic, uh, the church would still consider that a sacramental marriage. So when two baptized people marry, regardless of whether they're Catholic or not, it is a sacrament. Um, so in those kinds of situations, um, one of the things that, that I would do, I don't force anyone to do anything. I can only make suggestions and, and I don't get to spend a lot of time with them. But one of the things I suggest is I talk to them about their dreams for the future. You know, what, what do you want to happen? Uh, you know, look at me, I have gray hair. Uh, you're a young couple born in 1993. That's the magic date right now. And if, if that's the case, imagine yourselves uh, with gray hair like me and imagine how you would like your life to turn out. What, what would you like to be like as an older person, as a couple? And I kind of ask them to think about how their faith might impact their goals. So if one of the things we do in marriage is make promises to be faithful to one another uh, for all the days of our life, if we promise that, are we more likely to learn how to be faithful 
uh, by watching football games on Sunday or by going to mass on Sunday. Um, you know, if we want our children to turn out a certain way, um, baseball is great. There's lots of lessons to be learned from baseball, but will baseball teach them the life lessons that we want them to have to grow up to be the kind of people we want them to be? So, so it's not that I'm saying that some of their more secular goals are bad, but they're only part of the picture. And maybe if they think about it, you know, raising the kind of kids they want to have, having the kind of marriage they want to have, um, those things would be greatly aided and facilitated by faith. So if you think about someone, for example, uh, they've, they've kind of looked at people who are going through suffering. Well, when we go through suffering, typically one of two things happen. Either it draws us closer to God in our faith, or it draws us away from our faith. And, and the difference is usually who our friends are. So if, if all our friends are on bar stools, that's going to be very different than if all our friends are in the pew. Now, I'm not saying that we only need to have friends that are in the pew, but, but, but the way that our friends think about life and the universe tends to influence how we see things. And if we surround ourselves with people who believe, then as we go through suffering, that strengthens our faith and draws us closer to God. Whereas if we surround ourselves with people who don't believe, um, well, it's going to have a different impact. So, so the conversation for me would go kind of along those lines, but it's only a conversation of encouragement, okay? I can't make them do anything. I can just invite them to think. So hopefully that's the answer to your question. We have just a few minutes. Are there any other questions or any comments before we close out here? How about you, Scott? Any last words you want to say? And if so, um, please share those. And then if you would, um, end with a prayer for us. Okay. Um, my, my only words are uh, thank you for listening to my story. Um, everyone's story is unique and personal. Um, I would say one thing that I've learned is sometimes people don't think they have a story, but every single person does. And you have no idea how powerful your story is. So uh, please, I encourage you, share your story with other people. It, it is actually um, a very powerful thing that God has given you. So again, uh, thank you for listening to me. And um, let's say a prayer in closing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, I pray that as we've listened and prayed and thought tonight, that you would just draw us closer and closer to yourself as we enter this uh, special time of year where we think about um, your suffering, your death, your resurrection. Help us to be thankful, to appreciate what you have done for us, and to be willing to receive that from you, that gift that you're giving us of of eternal life and salvation and the ability to have our life transformed by you. So as each one of us goes out into the world, um, I pray that you would bless us with your spirit and may almighty God bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you again for joining me on this little journey. And I pray that God would bless you and, and enrich you. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I'm muted. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.